There was a time when a German actor's CV was pretty much nothing without the words trained with Reinhardt written on it. If you could claim to have worked with Reinhardt, then you probably didn't need a CV anyway. Those two words, that name, was all the qualification you needed. Getting into the Reinhardt School was the driving ambition of many would-be actors and must have seemed a laughable, impossible dream to a young Austrian woman arriving in Europe from the African continent in 1910, ready for whatever adventures life might throw at her. You're listening to The Kiss, the story of the women who made a movie masterpiece, and this is episode six, Trained with Reinhardt. Max Reinhardt was the first internationally renowned artistic director, the man who elevated the role of theatre director from the largely administrative to the entirely aesthetic. His experience in the theatre was extensive, his reputation colossal. Two of Germany's biggest screen stars of the 20s and 30s, Konrad Veit and Emil Jannings, were directed on stage by Reinhardt. Jannings went on to win the first ever Best Actor Oscar in 1929 and transferred his career to Hollywood. The Polish actress, Pola Negri, who was a huge star in the States, came under Reinhardt's tutelage while still starting out in her career. Nosferatu director F.W. Murnau was a Reinhardt pupil, spending three years with him as both actor and assistant director. A young Leni Riefenstahl, then a dancer, toured in one of Reinhardt's prestigious shows in the 20s. The Austrian-born Anton Wahlbruck also got his training under Reinhardt. He went on to corner the market in classy continentals in the British movies of the 1940s. Marlene Dietrich was happy to mention that she failed her audition for a place at the Reinhardt School because that kind of heroic failure was still worth boasting about. Reinhardt, who was born Max Goldman in Austria, started acting at the age of 17 and changed his name when he was offered a place at the highly respected Deutsches Theater in Berlin, the city's most important and high-profile playhouse. The dramatic taste then was for naturalism, and it wore thin on him, all that sticking on of beards and eating sauerkraut night after night. He had another vision and it was about spectacle and the merging of old and new traditions in theatre. His first solo venture was the formation of an uninhibited comedy review called Schall und Rauch, or Sound and Smoke, which was at first nothing more than a group of very talented friends getting together and putting on comedy and musical skits for their own entertainment. When Reinhardt let the public in, it was an instant success and opened more doors for him. At the Neues Theater in 1905, he put on a true spectacle, a version of A Midsummer Night's Dream which blew the audience's mind with its revolving stage and massive cast. Not long after that, he became director of the Deutsches Theater and his first move was to buy the property next door and turn it into a Kammerspieler or chamber theater and open an acting school. His firsts? carving out a definitive artistic and experimental role for the director, staging Shakespeare in modern dress, inventing repertory theatre, training actors in his own method. Every production had to astound, set out to make a huge impression. He astonished London in 1912 with his staging of The Miracle, a religious epic with a cast of 1,500 at the Olympia Exhibition Centre. He was the pioneer of the holistic theatrical experience. For the miracle, he and his designer, Ernst Stern, converted the arena into a cathedral, seating 8,000 enthralled spectators. Among the premieres Reinhardt staged was Frank Wedekind's Spring Awakening. Some 16 years after it was written, such was its perceived inflammatory nature. It was an historic production, playing 615 times over 20 years. The version of Gorky's Lower Depths 
that Leontine Schlesinger watched utterly rapt that night in Berlin in 1903 was universally acclaimed and ran for more than 500 performances. His name meant innovation and uniqueness, and it was well known way beyond Germany. Reinhardt is now perhaps best known to English-speaking audiences as the director of the shimmering 1935 Hollywood version of A Midsummer Night's Dream, starring, among others, James Cagney, Mickey Rooney and Olivia de Havilland in her film debut. But his contribution to theatre is unquestionably still recognised and lauded. To his contemporary actors and pupils, he represented the pinnacle of artistic achievement, but it was more even than that. Those who worked with him belonged to something great. For many actors, his experimental and modern productions were the outlet for which they longed. He gave them the opportunity to work in a free, encouraging and exhilaratingly creative environment, a place and time where all that mattered was giving your all to the work in hand. And in this workplace, all were equal, judged on the honesty of their acting and not by any other social parameters. Christian, Jew, straight, gay. If you had something, you were encouraged to flaunt it. To all these acolytes, including Leontine herself, he was referred to as the master. To perform in one of the master's productions was to reach an undisputed peak in your career. We last saw Leontine utterly rapt while watching Reinhardt's production of The Lower Depths at the Kleines Theater in Berlin. It was 1902 and she was 13 years old. Even if she felt strongly that she wanted to be an actress, she knew that it could never happen. She was heading back to South Africa with her mother, and anyway, her parents could never afford to pay for her to go to drama school. Leontine returned to Johannesburg and a mixture of work and sporadic education. The place seemed dull to her after her European travels. As ever, she'd longed for Africa while she was away from it and felt bored by it once she was there. In her latter teens, she found work in the Austro-Hungarian consulate as a secretary. Here, she watched a fascinating parade of people come and go, from big game hunters to stranded travellers. Johannesburg was growing in stature. As wealth increased, class arrived, and the sense of a mining backwater dwindled. Leontine describes her time at the consulate as a happy, uncomplicated period, where she enjoyed flirtatious relationships with her male colleagues, not least the consular attaché. She was slim and slight of build, with dark hair and sharp features, including wide, expressive eyes. You get the sense of a young woman who was proud, strong-willed, self-educated, desperate to live life to the full, waiting, just waiting. And then, shortly before her 21st birthday, she inherited some money and she was off. The idea was to go travelling in Europe for six months, soak up the culture and then head back home to return to work in the consulate. She started with Vienna, where she stayed with relatives. But the charm soon ran out for her, and she travelled by herself to Berlin. It was summer, and only a few theatres were open, but she found one and settled down for the matinee, a French romance called Waltz of Love. Something strange happened. As the play progressed, Leontine found she was being carried away by the same strength of feeling that she'd experienced eight years before while watching The Lower Depths. She had the same urge to be on that stage and to be able to express herself. This time, she was determined that somehow she'd do it. With astonishing chutzpah, it has to be said, Leontine found out the address of the leading actress in the play and went to her house and asked to be let in. The maid tried to turn her away, but Leontine insisted that she brought greetings from mutual friends. She was let in, and as soon as the actress entered the room, Leontine confessed everything and begged to be given acting lessons by her. She was asked to recite something and nervously delivered a few lines of poetry, which must have made some kind of impression because the actress recommended that she see Dr. Paul Legband, director of the Reinhardt School, the next day. Although Leontine's audition for Dr. Legband a few days later was to her mind far from perfect, 
he too must have detected some promise because she got herself a place at one of the most illustrious acting schools in all of Europe. Leontine and her fellow students at the Reinhardt School of Acting were the chosen few. They didn't necessarily have much in common socially, and nor did they necessarily favour the same kind of acting styles. But they were a charmed little crowd of passionate, ambitious young people. They visited the Berlin theatres together and hung over the balcony, watching the performances intently and arguing over them even more aggressively afterwards. They felt particularly exercised over plays directed by the master himself and would gather in a local pub after a premiere, getting more and more heated over niceties of stagecraft. By the time Leontine entered the school, Reinhardt was no longer teaching, but she came face to face with him once, appropriately enough, while rehearsing the part of the firebrand landlady, Vasilisa, in Gorky's Lower Depths, the very play that had sparked her dramatic yearnings years earlier. Reinhardt entered the auditorium and sat on the front row, and at once the players stopped, stunned by his unexpected presence. Carry on, he told them, and they obediently picked up where they had left off. Leontine, so keen to make a good impression, was crippled by doubt and self-consciousness. She watched his face and noticed that those penetrating blue eyes were everywhere but on her. He was, she had to admit to herself, utterly indifferent to what he saw. He left shortly afterwards with a muttered, Thank you. There could have been no worse response than simply not caring. To the ambitious young Leontine, so desperate for validation, it was yet another moment of introverted agony. It's not like she wasn't suffering already. Suffering, or at least an artistic and rather precious understanding of it, was what her training was all about. In her memoirs, she recounts, in her characteristic hyperbolic turn of phrase, what she got up to in her boarding house of an evening. What follows is an astonishingly grandiose account of simply learning her lines. Out of rebellion and disinclination inexorably emerged the desire to create, to compel that being within the pages of the book to come alive. Feelings, words, gestures gradually shaped themselves and demanded expression. When I heard my voice in the stillness of my room, it startled me at first. So I whispered my lines softly and objectively, not daring to touch the chords of imagination too suddenly. Moreover, when I placed the furniture according to the stage directions, my movements were furtive, because I had the feeling that someone was watching me. Eventually these ghosts were conquered. I repeated aloud words, sentences, exclamations over and over again, battling with them, cajoling them, flinging them aside in violent rage and endeavouring to get to the roots of their meaning. When I had wrestled thus for two hours, I felt exhausted but utterly convinced that only in acting could I fulfil myself. This extraordinary passage may feel somewhat overblown to our tastes, but the sense of artistic excess came with the package. By landing a place at the Reinhardt School, the sine qua non of dramatic acting, she must have felt she had an awful lot to live up to, and conscientiously assumed the breathless ardour that a Reinhardt student required, a dramatic role in itself. When the year at theatre school was over, it was time to go out and work, if she could find any, and back came her mother, ready to embed herself firmly in her daughter's life. Leontine's father had died while she was at the Reinhardt School, and she and Emma were thrown together for better or for worse, and for more or less the rest of Emma's life. Emma's role seems to have been to keep her daughter on the right side of propriety, in a profession considered seedy by some, if not downright morally dangerous. Leontine Zagen, as she was now known, was 22 and hardly needed a chaperone, having already travelled round Europe with boyfriends, and anyway had made her feelings clear as to how she wanted to earn a living. The arrangement was probably a mutually supported one, and it also gave Emma the chance to return to German-speaking Europe, a mix with the circles she most enjoyed. She became a kind of de facto Batman, finding lodgings and keeping them homely for her daughter. 
Despite Leontine's extensively detailed memoirs about her professional exploits and her many newspaper interviews in which she outlined her professional theories and techniques, she was an immensely guarded individual and controlled the message of her private life in a way that would make any modern spin doctor envious. The overall impression of the young Leontine is that she was ambitious, restless and utterly immersed in her craft. If there was a plan for success as an actress, then it was more or less fulfilled in these early years of her career. She was usually in work, which in itself is something of an achievement, the Reinhardt effect perhaps, and enjoyed a variety of roles, from prostitutes to society ladies. She got to travel too, which was the defining feature of her entire life, and made more natural and easy by the experiences of her vagabond childhood. Leontine went from the Reinhardt School to the theatre in the Bohemian spa town of Teplitz, and from there to Dresden, where she first came across working on a make-or-break percentage basis, a community spirit which would come into its own much later in her career. Her next engagement was at the Neue Wiener Bühne, or the New Vienna Stage, where she laboured with increasing self-doubt through roles she considered beneath her or demeaning. She was in her mid-twenties, struggling to make something of herself, and an arresting-looking young woman, slim and willowy, always well-dressed, attractive, perhaps a little exotic, frequently landing leading roles, often walking on as a maid. But it was 1914, and if she was experiencing any of the turmoil of the unpredictability of her chosen profession, then it was vying with a far greater piece of soul-searching. How could she continue to wrap herself up in the indulgently febrile and self-obsessed world of the stage when all around her, young men of her age were simply disappearing off the streets? But as she wrote later in life, I was too selfish to exchange the theatre for war work. Nothing seemed so important as the stage. But then the First World War was fought on the battlefield and those who weren't there were unlikely to grasp the true horror of it. It seemed to Leontine that everyone had something angry to say about the state of society, particularly in the heated debating chamber that were the local cafes. She would visit the Café Borg Theatre with the hope of making enough useful contacts to get her more meaningful theatrical work. Among the regulars at the café was the writer Stefan Zweig, and Zweig's intellectual young friend, Victor Fleischer. Victor was quiet and shy, though direct with his views. His aim was to be a writer. He was, in Leontine's words, very naive about women. Leontine mentions Victor very rarely in her memoirs, which is perhaps strange given that they went on to marry. In a very brief passage describing their meeting, she says this, no matter how provocatively I behaved, it did not seem to impress him. And although he sought out my company, he never showed any interest in the woman in me. That notwithstanding, they came to agree that they loved each other. And when she left for a new job in Frankfurt in 1916, they knew that they would see each other again. Now, I feel uncomfortable speculating about someone's sexuality. Surely these things don't matter any more. But of course, it has to matter to us to some degree, because we're taking apart a film about sexual repression and we're following a psychological trail. Krista Winslow's writings were forever wrestling with questions of sexual identity. But you get a sense throughout Leontine's memoirs that she's only telling you what she wants to tell you, and the rest is none of your business. Her marriage was, if you're working on what she gives you in her biography, somewhat unconventional with her and Victor seemingly living apart much of the time, sometimes continents apart. Her stories of great passions and near misses with men during her youth feel rather stagey and, I don't know, unnecessary to me. It's absolutely clear that the truth of her personal life was off-limits. But it's that dogged silence, of course, that suggests so much. And I'm torn between instinctively respecting that silence while asking myself what role her sexuality played in her later creative decisions, if any. People marry for all kinds of reasons. And in a time when homosexuality was considered a deviation, say what you like about perceived Weimar freedoms, a marriage could be a place of safety and like-mindedness. 
You could marry out of genuine affection and companionship. Maybe you did it to shut down any speculation about you or to simply halt any sexual interest in you from others. You may do it to satisfy family demands. You may, of course, be deluding yourself. You may do it simply to be able to rely on someone who knows you and accepts you for what you are. Given the serious contractual nature of marriage, its social relevance, its legal boundaries, marrying simply to have sex with someone seems almost ludicrous. I wonder if Leontine and Victor had some private contract between them, an understanding, spoken or unspoken, that by being together they were buying each other freedom. Victor often seems such an afterthought, an appendage, even in her own memoirs. A breathlessly gushing full-page magazine article written about her much later in 1937 relegated the poor man to the last line with the utterly bizarre comment, Her husband is Dr Fleischer, who became Czechoslovakian as a result of the Treaty of Versailles. The First World War years were for Leontine by and large happy ones. They were spent in Frankfurt, the German city for which she had a great fondness, playing leading roles at the Neues Theater. As the war neared its end, food was scarce, money virtually worthless. She worked hard in multiple productions a day and was always hungry, but she and her fellow actors relished their jobs, and as she herself puts it, though our salaries were all equally small, this did not worry us, for money could not buy anything because there was nothing to be had. Theatrical tastes were changing. People's outlooks were changing. Having mastered classic German roles, as well as the naturalism and realism of Ibsen and Gorky, Leontine and her friends now watched with fascination the arrival of Expressionism. Largely a German phenomenon and relatively short-lived, it nonetheless created memorable moments in the visual arts. Remember several episodes ago our visit to the cabinet of Dr Caligari. The Expressionists rejected realism, which they said fiddled about with details and concerned itself with the surface. What they wanted was to explore the inner world. They wanted to focus on the psychology, not necessarily merely of the individual, but also of humanity. It was often a nightmarish vision, often uncomfortable. Its forerunners, the writers who set the scene for the birth of the movement, included Frank Wiedekind, in whose Pandora's box Leontine regularly appeared as the Countess Geschwitz. The turmoil in Expressionism aimed to reflect fractures in society. The First World War ended with mass unrest and geographic confusion. In the last episode, we heard how Christa and her husband Lutzi went into exile during the political upheavals following the end of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. In Germany, the end of the war brought revolution, and Leontine witnessed it firsthand. She had gone for an audition in Berlin, only to be struck down by flu in the great pandemic of 1918. As she began to emerge from her illness, she became aware of gunshots and mayhem outside. Leontine's relative youth and love for her work had got her through the years of starvation and poverty, but popular morale was at breaking point and the economy on the verge of collapse. The sailors at the Kiel naval base started the revolt, but other soldiers followed suit. Leontine, stuck in Berlin and joined by her new husband, who had been living in Vienna, saw the mutinying soldiers arrive in the city and heard the gunshots from hotel windows. The Kaiser was gone, but the socialist state that many fought for hadn't arrived. Instead, Germany became a republic, with its constitution assembly based in the central German city of Weimar. Leontine could only find work back in Frankfurt, and it was there that Victor opened what would become a major publishing house for books on the arts. They settled happily in the city for a while, but what could have been a comfortable life, with both adults earning, was impossible at a time of mega-inflation and work shortages. It's in this period that Leontine registers her first encounters with anti-Semitism. Not perhaps first-hand, but as a distantly heard muttering by misguided voices seeking to find someone to blame for a financial crisis. Leontine never liked to make much of her Jewishness in later life, was more puzzled than appalled, that other German speakers like herself, other lovers of German literature, should consider her to be from an alien race. 
right up to the 1920s, Europe's integrated Jews were high achievers, leaders in science and the arts, their middle classes flourishing at a time of opportunity and great creativity. It wasn't until the 1930s, as the historian Bernard Wasserstein puts it, that they were transmogrified from fellow citizen into bogey. This is how Leontine describes her own situation in relation to her and Victor's Jewishness. From an artistic and human perspective, we identified closely with Germany. Our literary friends were mostly Christian, and my best friends among the actors were also Christian. Literature and the stage stood apart from those social classes where anti-Semitism was prevalent. I made no special effort to associate with Christians, nor would I have rebuffed them for reasons of race. We simply didn't think about it. Frankfurt provided Leontine with work and an income. She had a decent apartment, which she shared with her husband and her mother. But she was restless. Berlin was the ultimate goal. To make it in Berlin was to be an actress with a national reputation. So she persuaded them to up sticks and off they went to the capital. It was the early 20s and expressionism was giving way to a movement called the Neue Sachlichkeit, or New Objectivity, a repositioned form of realism. In Berlin, the theatre experience was very wide, from the conventional to the ultra-experimental. Berliners were passionate theatre-goers and had probably the finest menu of dramatic offerings to choose from in Europe, if not the world. Heinrich Mann, Bertolt Brecht, Bruno Frank, Ernst Toller. And yet Leontine did not find it easy to push her way into this world of opportunity. She had a couple of good breaks, including touring Paris. She was in the first German company to visit France since the war. She'd directed a couple of times in Frankfurt, and only when it had been offered to her. But it was rare for a woman to take control of a commercial play, which makes her achievement all the greater. Despite this, much of her time in Berlin was taken up with trudging from theatre company to company asking for work. A humiliating task, but one she insisted on doing. She couldn't just sit back and wait. Leontine became very familiar with the offices of theatre directors, despite spending only moments in them before she was shown the door. She even tried the odd film studio, coming face to face with business moguls that she described as ex-manufacturers of silk or shoes or whatever their business came from. The 1920s passed this way for her, a combination of starry highlights interspersed with the demeaning search for work. Was it her age? Was it bad luck? Was it changing tastes in a changing world? And then, as the decade turned 30 and she turned 40, she got a call from the office of one of Germany's great cinema pioneers, asking if she would come in to talk to him about a project set in a boarding school and with an entirely female cast. Next time, we return to Krista and find out how her own increasingly desperate attempts to make a living meant her path would soon cross that of Leontine Zagen. The Kiss, the story of the women who made a movie masterpiece. Researched, written and presented by Bibi Berkey. Studio production was by Francis Nutbeam Webber. It was directed by Mark Lingwood and the original music was composed by Timothy Bond. It was brought to you by Tempest Productions.